Hello and welcome to Half Time Report. I'm Sonia Shinoy and with me is Nigel D'Souza. Well, the market is not too bad, you'd have to say. The Nifty is holding on to the 200-day moving average of 16,990. Yes, it is very, very volatile, but just about marking time around the 17,000 mark. Uh, the Bank Nifty is the one that's sulking a tad bit, but overall, you'd have to say, uh, in terms of individual constituents, a lot of PSUs are doing well today, BPCL, ONGC, a lot of the FMCG names are coming back in a big way. It's the start of the festive season, so perhaps consumption is the order of the day. So HUL, Tata Consumer, Britannia, etc., all well in the green. Hi, Nigel. Well, hi, Sonia. You know, but the Nifty is seeing selling pressure at higher levels, and those bounces are li likely to be met with some kind of supply. And I'm just looking at today's levels, and... Looking at the high and the low of the day, you're getting the markers out there. So the high of the day is added on that 17,177. Uh, you know, I expect uh, that to be a bit of a resistance zone, that 17,150 to around 17,200. On the downside, though, it, it appears the bulls want to fight uh, for that 16,950-odd mark, whether it's an algo trade, whether or not there's buying interest that comes out there. But that's an important mark on the downside. Until we're trading about that level, I'm expecting a bit of a bounce because the call writing is becoming all too simple. 17,200, 17,100, 17,000 call. Just take a look at the massive open interest build up out there. Call writing can't be so simple according to me. And the PCR has come down to around 0 0.66, 0 0.67. Remember, that's the lower end of this band. So in the past, we have seen from around this 0 0.6, 0 0.65 odd, you see a bit of a bounce. So let's see whether or not that does happen. Crucial support zone, Sonia, 100 and 200 DMA. That's the band. You know, the bulls will feel they are in the game till that band is defended. Today is low, extremely crucial. Let's see whether or not there's a bit of a bounce from here. Okay, well, uh, for now, at least it's calm, right? Whether yeah. it's a lull before the storm, no one knows. <laughs> but at least, it's. A, I think the bulls would take this with both hands. And there's no major gyrations either way. So it gives us some time to ponder over individual stocks and tell you about uh, businesses. TCI. Uh, the stock is up over 90% in the last 12 months and has been buzzing on the prospects of the national logistics policy. In fact, a lot of these logistic companies have been doing well. There's a pickup in auto demand, there's a festive season coming up and it's been a good Q1 so far. Vineet Agarwal, the company's managing director, joins in now to talk about that. Vineet, good afternoon and thanks for joining in. It has been a really uh, good last quarter for you. You also mentioned that you're on track to do this 18-20% to 20 revenue growth as well. But tell us how festive demand has been, which are the pockets that are expected to do well and what is the ground check? Hi Sonia, hi Nigel, uh, good to be back. Uh, it's uh, it's festival season has started and clearly you know uh, the highs from what we saw in uh, the last year we are clearly beating those highs uh, because there is a lot of demand across the sectors whether it is textiles whether it is uh, consumption led as you were just talking about uh, we are seeing automobile really picking up very, very strongly, whether it is the four-wheeler, three-wheeler, two-wheeler, um, and even on the commercial, on the B2B side as well. Uh, so in the last few months, uh, the the trend and the track has been good towards uh, inventory buildup, stocking that has taken place. And I think that will continue for the next few months uh, as we uh, go into the festival season. Barring that, also generally the uh, mood is a bit upbeat as well. Uh, we've not, uh, you know, the debt positions in the com country is relatively stable. Uh, companies have started to invest also to some extent. But uh, overall, uh, we are quite positive that the 15-20% top line uh, growth that we're looking at should happen. So, uh, hi, Vineet. Good to speak to you after a while. Uh, so you're sticking to the top line guidance and you're sounding quite upbeat, which is encouraging in this sort of a market scenario. What about margins? You expect it to hold at current levels? That's what you said the last time around. So I wanted, uh, you know, margin guidance on that front. And also overnight we had news that Mahindra Logistics, well, they have bought Rivigo's B2B business. Do you expect the m and business, uh, you know, action to uh, spice up from here on? Are you looking at any potential acquisitions? So, yes, we expect our margin uh, structure to remain uh, stable. And uh, even though fuel prices have moved up and down, and we tend to typically pass on our fuel, uh, any kind of fuel increases that happen. Um, what's happening in this space, and you would have read the national logistics policy as well, is that the market is quite unorganized. There is about, uh, and I think the report said about 90% of the market is still unorganized. So there would be some level of consolidation that will happen in uh, as we go forward in the logistics space. Barring that, there's also a certain level of new startups that have come in which are not doing too well also. So that consolidation will also happen. 
so I think it's a general trend that we are going to see that some consolidation, some new players will keep coming up. Uh, but uh, I think the alignment to the national logistics policy will be quite important. And a company like ours, for example, we have been conscious that something like this will happen. Um, it will lead to a lot of growth, specifically in the area of multimodal logistics. And we are quite uh, well prepared for that. Okay. I just wanted a little more details, Vineet, on what's happening in the auto sector because you provide end-to-end -end, uh, logistics services over there for the entire industry. Have you added any new clients on board? Uh, you know, there's a big spurt in demand that we're seeing, especially now that we're heading into the festive season. And what's the total contribution to your business? What could the growth opportunity be? So auto logistics is a big uh, area for us. And as you rightly pointed out, we do not just the uh, inbound logistics, but even the outbound logistics, including spares uh, management for a large number of auto players from the two wheeler, three wheeler, uh, four wheeler to tractors, to earth moving equipment companies, to commercial vehicles. And uh, the trends are quite good. We've acquired a lot of new businesses and also some expansion because some companies have gone on for that expansion as well, what we have done in the last uh, possibly two years is to add the rail multimodal element uh, onto the automotive uh, segment that we cater to. We have our own three trains under the AFTO policy, and we are able to move uh, 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 on an average, not just using our own trains, but also uh, taking uh, on lease from the railways more than 100 trains a month. Uh, that is carrying finished automobile carriers. So what is happening is the, the shift has happened from road to rail when we see uh, the actual movement of the finished goods. Uh, it's a significant trend because this also leads to lower uh, greenhouse gas consumption and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is one thing and we have created yards, almost uh, 30, 40 yards across the country where we operate on a hub and spoke system for the automotive sector. Okay, all right. Uh, Vineet, uh, you know, what about the freight rates? Uh, how are they panning out? Uh, do you get the benefit of uh, spot rates or is it pre-fixed? If yes, uh, you know, what, what are the contract durations? Uh, even though our economy has evolved to, uh, a lot, it has evolved a lot, but uh, the freight rates are still a subject of uh, demand and supply rather than uh, costs. Uh, for example, if agriculture uh, output in a certain region increases substantially, we definitely see freight rates moving up. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the, when there is a general increase because of uh, some level of uh, fuel price increase, we are able to pass it on to our consumers uh, right away because our contracts are built like that. Uh, however, notwithstanding, I think overall cost pressures remain high, uh, but I think they can be mitigated with the growth that's coming. You've also added 10 new branches during the quarter in the west and northern region. You're planning to add around 50 branches in the full fiscal year. Uh, can you tell us what is the incremental revenues that you'd be getting from all of the, uh, these expansion plans? A branch expansion and network expansion is a regular process uh, because what happens is there could be a new uh, uh, industrial zone that's coming up. For example, uh, Jawar Airport is being constructed now. We would set up an office there right away. Uh, so that we are able to service our clients there. Either they are sending material there or they are uh, moving material out. So like this, it's a constant process of network expansion. And uh, I would not be able to say specifically in terms of the uh, uh, additional output, but definitely it's an ongoing business uh, expansion plan for us. Mm. All right. Uh, uh, Vineet, what about that, uh, you know, JV you have with uh, Concord? Uh, you know, what's that for? Could you give us some more clarity on that front? Yes, a few years ago, we realized that multimodal is going to be really, really big. And as we can see in the national logistics policy, also talking a lot about multimodal logistics, how we need to really move from rail, from, sorry, road to rail and even coastal shipping. Um, and uh, in that, we uh, formed a joint venture with Concord this uh, about uh, eight, nine years ago. And the idea was that we are able to service our clients uh, on a multimodal basic, uh, where the first mile and the last mile is by road, and then the middle mile is by uh, by rail. And we, we again move more than 100 full rakes every month on average in mm -hmm. that business. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an end-to-end -end domestic uh, logistics multimodal play. So for this multimodal business, just wanted to understand uh, what exactly is the mix today for your own business and how do you see it move over the next couple of years? 
so over uh, the last uh, several years from 100% ro road business we've actually down to about 65 or about two thirds of it is now road business uh, notwithstanding and every rail as well as uh, coastal shipping you also need road because of the first mile and the last mile uh, we are moving cargo for example from north india by rail to let's say our port in kandla where we load it onto our ships and they go to uh, the south where we deliver it by road so pure multimodal is something that we are already doing today and this is uh, definitely going, going to increase in the next few years. Vineet, when Concord gets uh, privatized, you know, the street is waiting by for the last few years or so, what happens to the JV? Does it continue or do you have a clause in there? Uh, I, 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 you know, if you could give some clarity on that front. Uh, very difficult to talk about that considering that we have NDAs around uh, these things. Uh, so, yeah, let's see what happens. Okay, Vineet, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and all the best. Uh, with the uh, new logistics policy coming on board and multimodal as the big theme. Uh, no wonder the stock has been on a tear. Uh, Transport Corp now almost at uh, 785 rupees. It's had a fairly decent run. A three-month chart, a 12-month chart will come up for you and you'll see the kind of uh, moves that uh, some of these logistic companies have had. Uh, let's slip into a quick break. On the other side of the break, we'll connect with... Uh, or we'll rather put focus on PFC and Power Grid as the Power Ministry has rejected RDC's proposal of selling PFC stake to Power Grid Corp. Stay tuned for more. Welcome back. The market is actually picking up pace, so don't lose sight of that. All four indices are now once again in the green. After the early morning dip, it's sort of, uh, you know, all over the place for the market. But perked up by some of the large caps like HUL, ITC, Holding Fort, HCL Tech, there's Infosys, Wipro. So IT is making a bit of a comeback, HDFC, TCS, etc. Let's see a pullback from the lows. But Power Grid has been perking up after the government has rejected a proposal for it to acquire PFC stake in REC. We had a chance to speak to the management as well, but Vivek is here first with more details on all that has transpired. Uh, Vivek, over to you. Well, uh, that's right. So, Power Grid, you know, has been one of those stocks that has been in focus for the past uh, couple of trading sessions. First up, there was a news flow that stated that, you know, the company may be asked to pick up PFC stake in RNC. And this had actually led to a significant fall as far as, uh, you know, the stock price was concerned. The main reason for this particular fall was the fact that, uh, you know, brokerages had highlighted that this would lead to a valuation derating on capital allocation concerns. Also, there were worries that, you know, the dividend deal that the stock provides of close to 6% would drop down quite drastically. In fact, uh, Jeffries had pegged that it would fall to around 4%. Now, uh, yesterday, what actually happened is that CNBC TV18 actually confirmed that the government had decided that REC will continue to be a PFC company. And this means that, you know, there would be no overhang as far as Park Grid was concerned. City, in fact, today has reacted to this particular development and City has said that this particular clarification that we have given removes a major overhang as far as the stock price of Power Grid is concerned. In fact, they're saying that uh, uh, they continue to maintain a buy on Power Grid on the back of the fact that it continues to provide a safe and stable business model. In fact, they also say that the company enjoys very high ROAs and which is why it's among their top picks. Got it. Thanks a lot for that, Vivek, to putting all that into perspective. Well, earlier today, we caught up with Mr. R. Uh, Lakshmanan, the ED at REC, who confirmed that Power Grid's acquisition of REC is off the table as the Power Ministry clarification. Let's hear him out. PFC acquired REC stake, uh, what the government was holding, I think, uh, in 2018 December. And uh, after that, like, uh, uh, overall, like, uh, REC has been functioning as a subsidiary of uh, PFC. However, government was having direct control on REC. And uh, in the meanwhile, there were, uh, you know, options that were explored. Uh, in terms of uh, who else would be uh, you know suited for uh, REC, but uh, uh, in uh, like uh, balance of things, I think uh, yesterday Ministry of Power took a call that uh, you know status quo would be maintained. Q2 is uh, I think would be better than uh, what Q1 was, and full year I think uh, you know it's difficult to give a guidance, but then like it should be much better than uh, the last financial year as a whole. All right, let's shift uh, the spotlight to the auto space then. Maruti Suzuki unveiled its uh, mid-size SUV. That's a Grand Vitara. Sonia, you have bull and bear versus, uh, on this line. Uh, I think, are you looking at a new weekend? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, if anyone wants to go for it, mm. I must say that the Toyota High Rider That's... is looking like a better option because uh, the Grand Vitara is 50,000 rupees more expensive, more expensive. than the yeah. Toyota High Rider. 
and you know as a brand as well toyota has always commanded that kind of premium so it's going to be very interesting how this goes uh, how this competition moves along but maruti is you know trying its best to plug all the gaps it doesn't have any major suv in a uh, mid-size suv in this segment and now the grand vitara has seen a very good response 57000 bookings have come through already as i said the pricing doesn't look very attractive and hence there are bull and bear case scenarios so first let's start with the bulls morgan stanley has an overweight call they have a target price of 9839 on the stock they say the order book is very strong and they expect market share gains for the company nomura has a neutral call but they have a target price of 8970 and they also talk about how the volume growth in fy23 will be very strong for maruti and the market share is expected to improve to 43 to 44% by the end of the year now the bear case clsa has been a bear on maruti for a while uh, they have a sell call a target price of 7374 they say that the pricing of grand vitara is not very attractive and there is so much competition in this space with you know uh, well entrenched player players like the creta you have the skoda kushak you have the um, the toyota high rider so there's so much to choose from it will be hard for maruti to penetrate kotak has retained the sell as well uh, same case over there they have a fair value of 8150 they say that it's going to be hard to make inroads into this mid size suv segment but let's see uh, the pie is growing quite a bit um so you know i mean bull and bears are there but for now the stock is i think not doing too much okay all right so now thanks a lot for that well let's shift our focus to some other stocks that are buzzing in trade sbi cards that's on our radar on the back of the company's performance in august abhishek joins us to fill us in with more on that abhishek Uh, well, Nigel, uh, there has been uh, credit uh, card data given out by uh, RBI, wherein you know uh, the performance of SBI card on uh, versus the industry average has been good, especially on total spends as well as you know the credit card issued. So the total spends have grown by 1.24 percent month on month, uh, versus a decline of 3 percent that you are seeing for the industry as a whole. The total uh, cards issued have grown by 2 percent month on month, uh, versus a 2.82 percent decline that we are seeing. for the industry has a whole however average spends are down 0.8% month on month this compares to about 0.2% uh, month on month decline seen for the industry as a whole uh, in terms of uh, card issuance they have gained market share month on month uh, to about 19% for the month of august versus 18.1% that they had in the previous month but the smart gain that they have seen is the share in spends wherein the market share is the highest in last 5 uh, months coming in at 17.4% versus 16.7% and that is why the stock is in green today. Okay, thanks a lot for that. That's an SBI card. But moving on, Mahindra Logistics is buzzing in trade as the company has bought Revigo's B2B Express business. Mangalam is here with all the details. Mangalam over to you. Well, that's correct. So there has been a positive development in Mahindra Logistics. The stock sitting with a gain of almost three percent, mildly off highs uh, with the market. But remember, you know they've gone ahead and made an acquisition. Revigo's B two B business is what they've bought for about two hundred and twenty five crores. Remember, Revigo is the company that uh, pioneered the relay logistics service. They had two arms. That was uh, full truck load logistics as well as B two B. And in that, Mahindra has gone ahead and bought the B two B vertical. The B two B business so in FY twenty two did revenues of around three hundred and seventy one crores. Of course, much higher. than what we saw in FY21 but lower than what we saw in FY20 FY20 was an exceptional year for online commerce as well because of the pandemic but importantly Mahindra Logistics own revenues in last year were over 4000 crores and in the first quarter itself was around 1200 odd crores so this incrementally adds about no more than 8 to 9% to their overall revenue the bigger trigger however here will be the kind of leveraging that these guys can do with Revigo's network of uh, you know 250 plus processing centers a million point 15 uh, uh, square feet of land or uh, you know uh, the warehousing area that uh, Revigo has so even if they go ahead and do about 6 to 7% margins on this 371 crore revenue that Revigo has done it would be accretive for their return on cash because it would mean about 10% on the 225 crores that they are deploying the question however is how much can they scale up this business with uh, their existing ecosystem okay that's on mahindra logistics thanks sir mangalam for that but moving on let's slip into a quick break here's some great news for investors you can now track us market action real time on money control log on to the money control website or the app and stay informed about all that matters in global markets 
Well, it's a quiet trading session, but a lot of stocks actually from the broader markets are spiking up as we speak. Pull up the intraday chart of Havels. You know, the stock was in the red when we started off the show just a short while back. That's moved into the green. It's a pretty good move out there. Union Bank is the other stock that's uh, suddenly seen a bit of a spike up. And from the FMCG pack, Goodrich Consumer, well, that stock is moving with some good momentum. We also have Colgate. So Colgate and Goodrich Consumer, both of them should come up for you on the screen. There are a few stocks that are otherwise, uh, you know, moving higher in a wobbly market. But let's uh, turn our attention away from equity market and focus on the rupee. It's recovered after a three-day fall. Bond yields also have uh, cooled off a little bit. Lata is with us to fill us in with more on that front. Lata? Well, there clearly is some kind of an exhaustion or a peaking off of the dollar rally. It's, I mean, either flat or inches below it's uh, 114 and a half that it had touched it's like more closer to 14.05 this is also because a lot of central banks have intervened first the boj intervened the pboc has been intervening so it's there is a sense of you know enough it has run enough and there is a bit of a peaking of maybe temporarily so today we've seen many of the asian currencies okay or at least a handful of the asian currencies recovering the indian rupee has recovered so has the thai baht so has the korean won uh, but we must be aware that there can still be a potential of uh, reverses. The Chinese yuan has still been depreciating. And since we export a lot uh, to that country and import even more from there, uh, if the yuan depreciates, uh, the deficit increases with China. So we have to keep an eye. We, uh, the, the, uh, the RBI may actually prefer a gentle depreciation like the yuan. But for the moment, the point is that uh, Asian currencies or the fin world of uh, currencies itself, currency markets, is catching its breath. And uh, uh, there have been no sharp moves after that uh, uh, over the weekend move in the pound. The bond markets as well in India are showing a decent recovery. Already yesterday we saw the 10-year spot yield recover a bit towards close because people had gone seriously short and they were covering shorts. Today we are seeing, you know, the uh, OIS, the overnight index swap market, which is a very, very liquid market, which reflects uh, the mood of the market. Also seeing yields either peaking off, staying flat like yesterday or falling off. Now, why are they flat? Because already the one month OIS is factoring in a 50 basis hike by the Reserve Bank. Now, how much more is there for that yield to rise? Likewise, the one year OIS uh, already yesterday was reflecting 6.9. I mean, that means the peak repo rate, the Reserve Bank should be raising it all the way to 6.75 or 7. Uh, that looks a little unlikely at this juncture. So there was a bit of an overshoot. And today we've seen all those yields also inching down by a couple of basis points. We will have to wait and see because the US yields are still in uh, an upping mode. Uh, from 3.79, they moved to 3.82 overnight. So there is still an upward pressure, but at the moment, uh, the Indian yields seem to think enough is enough. Thanks a lot for that, Lata. Well, speaking exclusively at CNN uh, News 18's Town Hall, Finance Minister Nirbala Sitharaman said that the rupee is holding up well against the dollar. She added that India is much better placed in comparison to other countries whose currencies have got ab absolutely hit against the US dollar. Let's hear her out. How Indian rupee, because of the strength of our macroeconomic fundamentals, is holding out well, and the rate at which other currency vis-a-vis -vis dollar has been, uh, rate of fall of other currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar has been sharply much more than Indian rupee. So, uh, is that a consolation? Partly yes, because the strength of your economy speaks when you're talking about your exchange rate. And as a result, we are far better than many other countries whose currencies have fallen pathetically against the uh, US dollar. Now, what is our strategy? The interventions, if at all, which RBI makes using the in, uh, Indian Reserve, which I think nearly 75 billion has been used, essentially to stop the fluctuations, the severe volatilities. RBI is not aiming at fixing the rate, exchange rate. The government doesn't believe in it. Dollar, uh, Indian rupee and its exchange rates, the uh, rate is also left to the markets to decide how it's going to float or uh, get fixated at some level. So RBI's intervention is more to avoid the fluctuation. 
the US Fed's action has an impact on all currencies. So we'll have to only be sure that the fluctuation is not going to be severe. On the one hand, some people do also speak that, you know, a falling rupee also helps uh, some people speak. I want that to be clearly understood, um, that a falling rupee helps in exports, whether it does or it doesn't. Theoretically, it may, but in today's condition with the recession outside and demands not really being as adequately as it should be, even a fall in the rupee may or may not help our exports. We are all conscious of these basic facts. We'll have to keep watching. Okay, that's the finance minister talking about that rapid uh, sort of free fall we saw in the rupee in the last few days. Of course, now it's stabilized a bit around that 8130 levels, but uh, that's the finance minister speaking at the town hall. Let's also listen into what the DEA secretary Ajay said and the finance secretary TV Somanathan had to say on the recent rupee depreciation. We'll come back. It is not a concern and is, uh, uh, the view which we are expressing is overblown. Because if you recall that about two years back, when the reserves were of the same order, even then the discourse coming out in media, etc., and even by, and by even, uh, even other informed uh, uh, persons, was that we have adequate reserves when they were two years back. Now, yes, there has been a depletion because of the inflows have uh, come down and at the same time uh, the, uh, the trade deficit at a higher level. But I don't see as a, a concern. India has a fairly large reserves. It's an international phenomenon, nothing peculiar to the rupee. It's dollar rise, not rupee fall. Sir, but is that a worry for you? No. Well, time to slip into a short break. When you come back, we'll have Sachi who will be joining in to tell us about his trading. Well, the Nifty is defending lower levels, which is pretty encouraging. NTPC has spiked a little bit higher. ITO Motors as well. There are hopes that, uh, you know, the newly launched bike, that's the Hunter 350, will at least pick up in terms of volumes. Profitability could be relatively lower. But uh, volumes is something that, uh, you know, the street is looking forward to. So that as well has pulled back. And Reliance Industries, that's the big boy in there, actually. When Reliance Industries recovers, it helps Nifty because it's a large component out there. And that moves to the high point of the day. The bulls seem to be relieved, at least for now. Sachit Anandu Dikar joins us uh, to fill us in with his view. Uh, hi, Sachi. How are you viewing the markets? 17,050. At least we defended that 16,950. Do you believe that risk reward could favor a long trade at some point of time? Or do you think we're going down, maybe to around that 16,700-odd mark? Uh, good afternoon, Nigel. Good afternoon, Sonia. Definitely, I think uh, this particular level should be defended. In fact, in the morning, we were expecting a move towards 16,950, and that particular move has worked out well. Uh, if you look at the data set, we are not expecting an expiry below 16,900. So I think 16,915. Uh, is the level wherein uh, you know you can place your stop losses. Probably a closing uh, would be very important in today's session. If we can get an inside bar kind of a closing, then that will be again an affirmation that probably uh, whatever uh, uh, decline that we saw in the last three trading sessions, that particular decline has been stabilized, and we may see a reversal getting back into the market uh, ahead of the expiry. So I think uh, it's a good idea to you know get into uh, some long positions here when it comes to Nifty. I think 17,000, 17,020 is a good decent level wherein some longs could be committed. The stop loss should be placed at 16,910 on a closing basis. And on the higher side, uh, we are expecting momentum once we see uh, the Nifty breaking out above 17,170. So probably the expiry range could be somewhere close to 17,200 to 17,280. So this is a good level wherein an, a reversal can be expected, a bounce back can be expected. And thus, I think uh, Nifty can be accumulated at 17,000. When we look at Bank Nifty, uh, I think uh, you know there is still uh, some amount of uh, weakness which has been exhibited. So it's it's a good idea to buy it uh, uh, on a breakout. Uh, the level of 38,780 uh, from a trading perspective would be important. Once we see uh, this particular level getting broken out, I think uh, the momentum could pick up on the positive side. We are expecting this particular move to unfold towards 39,500. I think that will be the juncture for uh, you know this uh, monthly expiry. So net net, I think uh, most of the bad news is there. Uh, uh, markets have already absorbed it, and probably we may see uh, both the indices stabilizing from here. 
Okay, what about the individual stocks? Uh, you know, someone earlier, I mean, the early expert was saying that uh, IT, perhaps after this big fall that we've seen, could see a recovery, maybe not now, but over the medium term. Would you believe that as well? And what would you do with individual names? Uh, certainly, Sony, I think uh, in the last two trading sessions, IT uh, uh, has uh, shown a lot of resilience. In fact, Infosys has managed to recover above its five-day exponential moving average. Even TCS is, uh, you know, not drifting lower. So probably we may see uh, some positive traction even on IT. But when we look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the entire data set, I think uh, there are certain stocks which have done phenomenally well uh, in the last one week. Uh, especially if you look at the uh, uh, performance of Dr. Lalpath Labs uh, in the last uh, six trading sessions, it has managed to sustain above its uh, five-day exponential moving average. And despite of the volatility, it has never breached below its uh, previous day swing low. In fact, after eight months, uh, this particular stock has reconquered the 200-day exponential moving average. So certainly, there is a lot of strength which has been exhibited in the last uh, few trading sessions, and that particular strength should be carried forward. So we are expecting uh, this particular move in Dr. Lalpath Lab to continue eventually towards 2660. The rollover data is also uh, supporting this particular price action fact. So from a trading perspective, the first target would be around 2540. The final target would be around 2660. And long position should be built in Dr. Lalpath Labs with a stop loss at 2380. Uh, the levels are from the October futures. And on the short side, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, metals uh, 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 and mining, I think there probably we may see some more accumulation of uh, uh, the bearish trend. So Coal India is one particular counter which has been on our radar. It has slipped below its five-day exponential moving average on the weekly basis as well. So we are expecting this particular move to extend uh, towards 208, 202 kind of a level. So fresh shots can be considered on Coal India with a stop loss at 221. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Sachi, for joining in and giving us uh, that quick take. Well, let's move on. Earlier today, we caught up with Nilesha, MD and CEO at Invision Capital, and he says that it's a good time to accumulate IT stocks, also gives us his outlook on the markets. Let's hear him out. The valuations, uh, the P multiples have become a lot more reasonable. Um, and our view is, is essentially is that don't expect the margins to further deteriorate uh, from, from the current levels. Uh, the demand environment still is pretty much intact. We've not heard of any IT companies talking of any slowdown in terms of demand, even if we reflect back to the past crises which markets like the United States or Europe face, even in that kind of an uh, environment, the demand for Indian IT services companies was pretty much non-discretionary. Um, so to that extent, we now see an environment where the demand is intact. The margins perhaps have moderated or have bottomed out, I'd say, and valuations have become a lot more reasonable. So from here onwards, uh, we don't expect the IT sector to be an underperformer. I think it's a good time to start accumulating a lot of high-quality, uh, growth-oriented IT stocks. I still expect India to be an outperformer in context of what's happening globally. Uh, just look at some of the growth estimates, the fact that you know GDP growth is still expected to be 6 to 7%, inflation is going to be still subpar what we are seeing in developed markets, uh, and at about 6 to 7%, we are still talking of nominal GDP growth of about 12 to 13%. And with margins now expected to improve because of the way commodity prices have fallen or the raw material and input prices have fallen, expect margins to probably kind of, you know, hold up or even get better over the next two to three quarters. So overall, the way we look at India is that we see a nominal GDP growth of about 12 to 13 percent and maybe an earnings growth, which is in probably the high teens. Okay, that's a fairly optimistic Nilesh, uh, both on the markets as well as on the IT sector. He says that large cap IT stocks are perhaps a good buy after the recent fall that we've seen. Let's take a quick break up on the other side. Insight Edge, which is our special segment, will be on uh, will be in focus where we talk about KPID technology. The company, remember, acquired a Europe-based company, Technica Engineering, and they gave us some very optimistic comments on what the way forward could look like. More on that in a bit. Okay, it's a special segment, Inside Edge. Today, the focus is on KPIT Technologies. The company has done a recent acquisition in Europe. Uh, the acquired company is called Technica Engineering. And the management was very optimistic that post the acquisition, uh, they can see an incremental 10% addition to their revenues. Reema is here to give us more details on that. Reema. Thanks so much for that. Well, you know, it's the acquisition which has got the street excited. KPIT Tech announced the acquisition 
of the Munich based group called Technica. They announced it last week. That time, the price of KPIT Tech was about 575, and since then, we've seen a rally in the stock price in the last one week. So, quick word about the acquired company KPIT Tech will be paying 80 million euros for the acquired company. The revenues of the acquired company were 43 million euros last year with EBITDA margins of 20%, and the company said. Uh, in the press release that the acquisition will be EPS secretive. Now today we had a chat with the management as you pointed out. So first what the management said on the contribution of the acquired company. Remember KPIT Tech gives you an annual guidance. So what the management said is that we will revise the guidance higher to incorporate the, you know, the acquired company but we will do that only once the acquisition gets completed which is closer to October end. So perhaps when they come out with their numbers we would have an updated guidance but they're saying that the acquired company should at least contribute 10% to FY24 revenues, which is when they'll have a full you know, 12 month contribution of Technica. On synergies, they said while they will not comment on individual clients of Technica, they did say that two of the largest clients of the acquired company Technica are in the top 25 client focus list of KPIT Tech. So they're looking to increase their penetration over there. But Technica also boasts of some of the disruptors, which is where KPIT Tech wants to focus on. And finally, we also quiz them about worries of slowdown since they're acquiring an EU based company and they have a global exposure. Well, they said that as of now, their interactions with clients, their engagements do not suggest any sort of a slowdown. Uh, technology budgets seem to be pretty much intact. Back to you. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Shreema. In fact, earlier today, we spoke to Kishore Patel, the co-founder MD and CEO at KPIT Tech. He, let's listen in to what he had to tell us about this new acquisition. There are some estimates which suggest that, uh, you know, this acquisition may add about 12% to your revenues. Uh, is that a, is that a uh, kind of uh, a, in the Certainly ballpark for next year. to look at? For, for the next year, that's how we feel. 24, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> at least 10% and then because it really depends upon how the other business grows also. So I think we are in that situation. So at least 10%, I would say. In two of the large accounts, I think that's where there's a uh, complementary. So uh, in line with our strategy about T25, that uh, will get uh, that will strengthen these accounts and uh, make us uh, our market share uh, will go up in these two accounts we see the client uh, interaction client engagement client momentum not being impacted much so we actually see a reasonable demand environment in europe uh, so that's that's where at least till now we are not seeing anything um, so uh, we don't see any concern on that area and specifically as you know we work with very closely with few clients so we get some idea beforehand okay so companies like kpit tech saying they are not too impacted by the slowdown in us in europe in fact if anything uh, they are seeing um, good demand trends across the automotive space let's slip into a quick break on the other side manisha gupta our commodities editor will be joining in she has with her peter maguire of xm australia stay tuned Welcome back and joining us on the show now is Peter McQuire, CEO at XM Australia. Peter, hi, good to have you again. And a difficult day at that and difficult month at that because most of the commodities that I'm looking at are ending this month yet again in negative. I want to start with the crude oil prices because come next week and it's going to be the OPEC and Allies meeting which the markets are watching with keen attraction. And then uh, we have the hurricane and the category storm to uh, Ian as well to uh, react to. How are you reading into both of these events? Well, good afternoon, Manisha. I think I'm reading into it that it seems to be a continual bear market sell-off and what we're seeing as far as equity markets, the, I, we've got the hurricane and the issue there with Hurricane Ian and what impact it's going to have to the production in the Gulf of Mexico. Secondly, of course, yes, OPEC sitting on their hands going, well, where do we move? What's the next point? Inflation really galloping and you've got the pound and what's happening as far as US dollar strength, Manisha. So, all cards are on the table and, uh, yeah, someone's holding, uh, I think, a raw routine. You know, I remember a couple of months ago when we spoke, it was it was a kind of a scenario that crude prices could have gone to 125, it could have gone to 75 as well. I mean, that's the kind of world we've been living in. But now that we yeah. have seen 190 and 80 break as well, what's your sense on where are we headed? Well, I think we're 77, 80 on the screen at the moment for WTI, Manisha, and you've got about 85 and a bit for Brent. I think that there's every chance you're going to see in the 60 handle as far as WTI, a high 60s. It's too hard to really speculate where because there isn't really that much room to move down. 
Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of concern if it starts to get into the 60s. There'll be OPEC will really come to the fore. They're being paid highly. If you're getting US dollars, then that's a very big win. But if you're paying some other currency, then you're really, that's a handbrake like no other. Oh, well, absolutely. And not just crude, the kind of sell-off that we've seen in metals as well, where in the last one week itself, uh, you know, any one of them is down between 5 to 10%. Uh, yeah. Would you be concerned here as well? Do you think it's oversold in some sense? Are you buying anything at all in that segment too? I think it's a time to be short. I'm looking okay. for consolidation as far as what's happening with base metals and that copper market, the tin. There's opportunity. I think at the time to be it is probably short at the moment, Manisha, more than long. Mm. And, you know, we're going to get a clear direction over the next couple of weeks. But there's a lot of information and data points that have really got to hit the market so we can get some sort of bullish momentum up to, the, to you know, to make us feel joyful leading up to Christmas. All right. You follow currencies very closely, Peter, and the last couple of months, uh, the last one week itself, has seen more and more currencies move to all-time lows, definitely multi-year lows. What's your sense on dollar index? I mean, we've done 114.5 and plus kind of levels, some consolidation or decline coming in from there. I mean, is U.S. going to get bothered at all with the kind of strength that the dollar is showing? Well, absolutely, Manisha. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, when you're looking at all these companies that have got earnings offshore, so it's going to be a certain um, handbrake again to earnings. You've still got PEs running at about 21 for the S&P. Your long-term average is about 14 and a bit. So mm -hmm. I think that where it's running at the moment, I'm looking at possibly even up to 117 as the new handle for, for US dollar index, currently at about 113.50. And what we're seeing as far as euro is 94, the new handle, 0.94. And when do we hit parity for the pound? We're already at 145 for that yen number. Everything's being created as far as every other currency against US dollar. And how so, how long do you see this scenario continue to play out? Oh, well, I mean, Fed Chair Powell's got one agenda, and that's to take us back to 2% inflation. So that's going to really, you've got to ratchet up and ratchet up rates quickly. I'm not sure how much further, you know, the, the Fed wants to be before, their, before uh, December 31 if it wants to really knock it up one and a half or even 2%, and that's going to push more momentum to the upside as far as uh, currency. So that US dollar, I think, has got more momentum yet, Manisha. It ain't over. And we're not even talking about the midterm elections in US in November anymore. I mean, do you think any major changes could be coming ahead of that? I won't be surprised. I'm looking forward to hearing, you know, how that all starts to really gain momentum in the next couple of weeks, because we're only, you know, five weeks out. So I think it's going to be dramatic and it's, uh, yeah, I'm looking for possibly some surprises and Biden's got his hands full when you think about what's happened with border crises and certainly inflation and currencies and look at the equity market collapsing. So, yeah, it's not a good sign for President Biden at the moment. OK, not a good sign for President Biden. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Peter and Manisha, for joining in and giving us a quick update on what's happening in the world of commodities. In the equity markets, though, the market has recovered. So that's uh, a sign, once again, of resilience that we're seeing. Uh, the mid-caps are in the green. The Nifty is up 70 points and now moving towards that 17,100 mark. With that, it is a wrap on Halftime Report. Business Lunch will take all the action ahead. Stay tuned.